don't know what benefit it has to say like Whitney Houston was colorless, you know, she was a black woman. Right. Uh, I think the fact that we are often so motivated to say that beloved black people transcend race or whatever is is a it, it, it's a fundamental problem of, of our society to pretend as if you can't be beloved and black. Welcome to the Etsy Podcast. I'm your host, Justin McRoberts. Artists and critics have a famously contentious relationship. It can seem at least that the discipline of critiquing art stands at odds to the discipline of creating it. Yet, I can't think of any professional artist who doesn't hold some really strong opinions about the work they consume as well as their own. And I've yet to meet a professional critic whose attention to an art form didn't at least begin in sincere admiration for, if not love for, that same art form. My guest on this episode is poet and cultural critic Hanif Abdurraqib. In our brief conversation, I think you'll find a vision of art, pop culture, industry, creativity, in which there aren't hard lines between diagnosis or analysis, and that long, loving gaze at what human hands have made. Our conversation actually begins with him reflecting on a Grammy moment in which Adele used time during her acceptance speech to suggest that Beyonce was, perhaps, more deserving of the award. Check it out. It was good. I thought it was good. Uh, and and that, that made me feel like Adele was aware of her place in this machine of, of music, in mm. American music. Yeah. Um, your love for Whitney Houston. Yeah. Can you talk about your love for Whitney Houston? I Whitney Houston was the first pop star that I think I realized was a pop star um, because I heard her in my house. And so I got to have a firsthand experience with her singing and hearing my, you know, mother sing along to her. And yeah. so she was the first pop star that I felt a connection to. Um, and she was like so, she was like our, she's kind of like, I imagine what Diana Ross was for, for black people in the 60s, 70s, mm. maybe. And Whitney Houston was this like thin and beautiful, perfect voiced singer who was kind of like our, our, like shining light. So huh. yeah, I love Whitney Houston a lot. And to this day, I mean, the, your work and in, in, in a minute, if you're okay with reading a piece, I'd love to have you read a piece. Is that, are you oh, sure. That? Yeah. I have but fine in, one, but. in in your work, you actually reference her quite a bit as sort of like, a, like she continues to play a role yeah. for you. Um, and something you talked about earlier about, uh, with regards to, um, you talked about her and Michael Jackson. Yeah. And, what you said something along the lines of like you sort of got used to the idea of black people being pop stars and then yep. started to wonder and you dropped a Jody Watley reference. Oh yeah. I was yeah. Like, but it was like you, you got used to the idea of, of, of black people being popularized and having a place in pop culture. Can you talk a little bit about like sort of like, like it was Whitney Houston, it was Michael Jackson, but it meant more than Whitney yeah. and Michael. So I think those two are my introduction to the black pop star and because they were so widely accepted and so widely, right now we have all these conversations about like how people are going to accept black TV shows and all this hmm. stuff. Like the the big conversation is around how we fit black people into popular culture um, in a way that they can be like consumed by people who are not black. But my first entry to black people in popular culture were those two, Whitney Houston and Michael Jackson, who were that exactly you know mm -hmm. they were the biggest pop stars in the world they were and so it it didn't i thought that everyone black could fit into popular culture seamlessly and be warmed by you know be loved by everyone and there wasn't even there wasn't even a and this is good and bad right like it wasn't like there was a lot of conversation around here's this gal whitney houston who is quite literally topping the charts yeah. every time every she time puts out. something out yeah oh and she's black Right. Like there wasn't that second part of the conversation. She was just Whitney Houston. Right. Same thing with Michael for the most part until a little until later, later into yeah. his career. But like Michael's success was like he was Michael Jackson and everyone sort of freely listened to Michael Jackson. There is though kind of a light and dark side to that. Forgive the sort of like weird pun there. But right. like it was good and bad that like their blackness wasn't a conversation. It wasn't a big deal. Yeah. Where it is, where, whereas it is now, is in like, that has to be a little bit, I, I don't know if it's like, there's sort of a, I don't know, there's a benefit to that, and, and yet there's sort of like a, like we're also missing something yeah, when we definitely. don't pay attention to them as black artists. Yeah, I think, I think 
it's important to acknowledge for me i always found it important to acknowledge them as they were um because you know i, I to me, Whitney Houston was a black pop artist, but she was also a beloved pop artist who was was loved by everyone. And I think she could be both of those things, mm. right? I don't think rejecting her blackness doesn't make her any less of a beloved pop star, you right? Know? Right. Um, and I, I don't know what benefit it has to say like Whitney Houston was colorless. You know, she was a black woman. Right. Uh, I think the fact that we are often so motivated to say that beloved black people transcend race or whatever right. is, is a, it, it's a fundamental problem of our society to pretend as if you can't be beloved and black and be fine and yeah. be still loved by people and be a whole person, right? Like a whole entire person with interests and, in, you know, a life. Yeah. So when you when you and I'd love to go back to stuff we were talking about with regards to like listening to punk rock growing up yeah. and listening to to and your your kind of ongoing romance with emo right right which is interesting yeah um, like your experiences with with like did you have like an early punk rock moment or like that was like this is for me like how did that happen I think when I started going to shows on my own like when I hit like seventeen eighteen you know when I was like out of my dad's house and you know, in my early years of, of college and beyond, you know, I could go to shows with whoever. And, right. You know, I, I saw some underground basement shows and it felt like for me, the songs were loud and short and it felt like this really sh quick shot of adrenaline that I kept wanting to get more of. Yeah. Yeah. And it was like local punk rock stuff. Yeah. Oh yeah. Just like local bands, terrible bands, you know, just like <laughs> anyone who can pick up an instrument and, and had the time to practice a little bit. Which was kind of the glory of punk rock. And that yeah. was sort of the whole thing. The whole punk ethos. was like, anyone should be able to do this. It was like this populist musical yeah. movement, which is exactly. really, really, like, really energizing yeah. for, like, the average kid. Yeah, it was great. Then you moved on, like, you moved on, you started paying attention to that. You kind of ended up falling in love with Fall Out Boy. So, you, like, you know, talk about this sort of spectrum. We've got Whitney over here, and you have Fall Out Boy. Yeah. Why Fall Out Boy? What is it about them? I think I saw them uh, because they were a band I saw from the very beginning. I mean, literally was at their first show. Um, and I think that was at a time where you felt connected to these bands. And, and to be fair, when I first saw them, when a lot of people first saw them in those early years, no one expected them to be famous. Right. So, you know, the fact that they got really famous was very weird. Right. Um, <laughs> Because they weren't great as no. a band. They, they were fun and they were exciting. They were like, they were doing at the time, and, and I know it's hard for people to place this now because of where they are, but they were doing a thing that not a lot of people were doing, right? Because they were the um, kind of like, you know, Frankensteining of, of all these like hardcore bands that had split up. And, yeah. and then they had this like scrawny, like white kid with a soul singer voice in the front of them. Right. So they were like, they didn't sound like anyone else because they, yeah. you know, they were like playing hardcore shows with a, a front man who thought he was Al Green, you know? Yeah. So it was very odd. And they were like, they were this really delightful train wreck that you couldn't look away from. I mean, it's we would go good. see their shows all the time. And it was because you never knew if crowds would hate them or love them, you know? Yeah. Uh, and there were moments in their shows where you could see the crowd go from hating them to loving them. And that was the best part. Yeah. That's, I love that. I want to I want to recapture a thing because I had the, the it was a little bit too, the volume wasn't great on that part of the conversation earlier. Yeah. But we talk about someone asked you because you talked about your love for the Fall Out Boy. Yeah, yeah. You talked about your love for punk rock, and someone asked you this morning about being a black kid growing up listening to what he called white genres. Right. And you responded by talking about like like the roots of American music. Can you re-answer that question? Yeah. Uh, the roots, I, I think I believe I said the roots of all American music are rooted in, in black people. Uh, so black people are at the roots of all American music, which doesn't mean that genres can't be predominantly occupied by white people. But you got to honor those roots, I think, and, yeah. and honor the roots of the music being made by those people and where that, that music came from. That you don't have rock and roll without African-American influence, yeah. which then then you don't have punk rock without punk rock, rock, and then you don't have emo without punk yeah. rock. and it's a it's a it's a 
it's a family tree that has a lot of branches, but the, the root is, is all, it's all there. It's all black music. There is a forgetfulness, right? I mean, there's yeah. like, a, like a constant, like a continual short-term memory lapse Absolutely. in American culture that we like so quickly move on from vital histories. Right. And that like part of what hip hop does as an art form is constantly points at roots whether it's like the bro- like the like specific geographical locations or I mean part of what makes hip hop hip hop is this constant turning back towards the past and saying you have to remember this. Yeah. It's sort of a like a it's a, it's a distinctive of hip hop. Yep. Is there a, is there a way in which uh, can you talk? I guess mean, like, can you talk about like the, the way hip hop does that for more than just because it's not just applicable to black kids growing up. Like I have to, as a white kid, recognize my own history. Right. But my, you know, the white artists I listen to growing up aren't referencing like roots in the same way. Right. Can you talk about like like the sort of I don't know the word I'm looking for, but something like sort of the, the broad doorway that hip hop ends up being for American culture. Cause it's really accessible like it is more accessible than almost any other musical genre yeah. I can think of. And it's sort of not, it's not like hip hop artists aren't just inviting black folks to look at their own history it really is an American invitation. Like let's look at our shared history through the lens of, of black history. Yeah. It's a storytelling genre too. Right. And that's what, you know, it's it's the rawest of storytelling genres and um, a storytelling genre that is doing a lot of reporting on communities that don't get reported on as full communities. Hmm. Um, you know, reporting on the interior of the quote unquote American urban experience in a way that does more than just gloss over it hmm. uh, or only highlight the bad parts of it. There's a lot of songs about love for the communities that people hmm. are in. And I think that it demands if you are truly listening it demands you to turn an eye towards these places that might have otherwise been ignored or gone off of your radar and so yeah it, it opens a door for america and, and asks people to kind of you know look inside your work as a poet you the word you you taught use the word nostalgia a bit right. yeah and you're really open about like you're pretty nostalgic as a person like uh, but you're also honest about what was the line you said? I'm going to look for it right here. You said, uh, I'm fiercely, uh, I'm fiercely committed to nostalgia, but we have to be honest about something old also being trash. Yeah. But like, like you, you, in your work, you are as a poet, you're, you have a lot of nostalgia, like in, in your work and sort of whether it's like what, you know, the, the poem, which I'd love you to read if you don't mind the, the one that begins with the picture of Michael and Whitney. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, can you talk about like your own like like personally like memories you have like root memories for you that are like th- these these memories of my own life are definitive and root memories for you do you have like those kinds of things not anymore i think oh really yeah i, I think that they've all kind of like become this one massive memory of, of childhood that isn't necessarily as i as it probably was right mm-hmm. um like you don't remember you you don't remember your childhood correctly kind of yeah thing? I feel like I, I no longer remember my childhood correctly um, because it's been so over romanticized in, in part and I think I will again but the writing of the book the writing of the crown ain't worth much really did a lot to romanticize my childhood in a way that maybe took me so far out of it that I I couldn't um, properly nail down any root memories anymore. But that will also, I know that's something that's going to come back, you know, right. it'll come back when I'm so, I'm a lot further removed from it. The book is still new. So yeah. um, once I'm further removed from it, I think it'll come back. Would you mind reading? You, sure. And I'd love for you to, to, that, that poem really hit me today. Let but me see if I can find either it. Either that one or if you want to find something from, uh, from the book that you'd rather. No, I'll read that we'll, one. I mean, that one is long. So if you're finally reading a long poem, yeah. Yeah, if you've got the time. Sure. All right. Uh, This poem is about a picture of Michael Jackson kissing Whitney Houston on the cheek. There's the picture of Michael Jackson kissing Whitney Houston on the cheek. And in the picture, Whitney is all teeth the way she was at the end of the 80s. The way she was in a white dress as wide as Heaven's Door at the Grammys where she couldn't dance in those heels but still sang a song about dancing. And in the picture... 
Michael is about six years removed from having his daddy's nose. And what better way to sever ourselves from the sins of the father than to rebuild the temple? And the kiss in the picture is gentle the way it might be for an old friend or a lover or two kin leaning for a moment out of the damned American engine of pop music again at their backs and howling for them to shake their skin to the ground and sing the hits. And in the picture, Whitney and Michael are under a tree and on a bridge somewhere south, and it is easy to imagine a song in the leaves, and it is easy to imagine a song in the water beneath them which once perhaps ran through a preacher's hands or over a baby's head, and history repeating itself wouldn't be so bad if not for the chorus of violences accumulating along the landscapes where small miracles sometimes took place, and in the picture both of their eyes are closed, and I wish for a home in that darkness, a small and black eternity. It is likely true that we only get one livable youth, and I wasted mine thinking myself beautiful, and throwing rent money into jukes, and scrawling my phone number on skin in summer, and watching it sweat off outside at Goodale Park where we just had to dance to the song we all knew, and performing self-worship as survival, and giving myself unkillable over to a parade of death instruments, and racking up just enough sins to make praying worth the time, and leaving socks tangled in bed sheets, and sneaking out of a room before sunlight ruptured its silence, and locking arms with a motley crew of hooligans in the drunken hours, and shoving five bodies into the back seats of cabs and opening the doors and sprinting down Livingston when it came time to pay the driver while he cursed the names of our families, a small penance for keeping the cash we'd spend on the pills we'd never be bold enough to take. And in the mirror, I would try to smile as wide as my mother, who in the early 90s would sing pop music while steam hung over her afro in the kitchen and who would crane her neck backwards to laugh like the jokes were spilling from God's own pockets. And I am telling you all of this to let you know that I too want to feel the heat with somebody. Or at worst, I want to be a child of the heat's eager production, the smoke that rises and dances thick in the air, a ghost over those who labor in our names and then become the ghosts themselves. And it's a shame our wings don't arrive until after we've already raced off the cliff and met whatever waits below. And it's a shame we still have all these living hands and barely anything left worthy of touch. The joke hiding in Thriller is that if you play anything for long enough, it can be like the dead never left. Revived. Swaying in leather down another boulevard, I tell my boys that Michael was most black when he died without being able to save his land, and no one gets that joke either. It seems the nightmares about drowning have again mounted my dreaming hours and have left me gasping into the stillness before morning, and yet I still have not learned to swim. In the bath, I sit with the water just below my chin, a height that would not cushion my hunger for sleep. The world is undoing itself and I must tend to my vast and growing field of fears. In this new country, a nightmare is nothing but a brief rental home for the mind to ransack and leave the sleeping body unharmed. Around the porch after the cookout, the big homie says, In the 80s, police were locking niggas up for putting anything to their lips and lighting a match, so it wasn't really shit to be smiling about. Then he closes a photo album on the picture of him as a boy in a single white glove. Science says that two dead stars collided once, and that's how Earth got all of its gold. And it is not vanity to cover yourself in what your people created underneath a summer's worth of southern branches. And it is not vanity to grow weary of telling the world you cannot be fucked with. And it is not vanity to cloak your casket in excess. And it is not vanity to have the people who love you bear the weight of your excess for one last time. And I imagine it as a question of comfort. Heaven as the only chart worth topping. And it turns out that I want all pictures of me loving my people to be in color. I want the sunlight whistling its way across our faces to always be amber and never an absent hue that might mistake our lineage for something safe. But I am talking of artifacts again, and not of how I cut my hands to the chins of those I love and kiss them on their faces. Then this type of love will surely be the death of us all. This type of love will surely shake the angels loose and send them running to their horns. I love that. Thank uh, you. The line, man, I want all pictures. It turns out I want all pictures of me loving my people to be in color. Yeah. That was a powerful, powerful moment. Thank you. The imagery there at the end it, uh, harkens to some stuff you've talked about with, with regards to like the season in Michael Jackson's yeah. career when you yeah. talk about excess. Yep. And that what he, was, what he was doing visually for you was more important than the music. That like his earlier music and even some of his later music was probably better music. Oh, yeah. But 
there is this season in, in, in his work as an artist, which he kind of focused on the visuals and right. it landed for you in a really unique way. Can you talk about that? Yeah. I liked, I liked like early nineties, Michael Jackson when he was like very comfortable with his pop stardom, I think, mm. and like not afraid to decorate himself in a lot of gold and like a lot of regalia and make these epic, you know, 10 minute long music videos right. that were like films and, really his vision became more about f- f- like leaning into the icon of himself that he'd already been, that he'd already been built for himself. And so that was like really freeing and really exciting to see a black artist do that. To go way over the top yeah. and be brazen about it yeah. and be widely accepted. Widely accepted because that doesn't happen in hip hop all the time. And so right. to have it happen in pop music was really cool to see. Yeah, because what what ends up happening is, you know, you know, hip hop artist shows up at the basketball game and folks are talking about his chains. Yeah. Or his earrings. Earrings, yeah, yeah. And there's Michael Jackson covered in gold. Yeah. Like painted himself gold. Yeah. There's yeah. a statue of Michael Jackson. It's gold. Yeah. And no one said boo. It was like, oh, that's Michael. It seemed it seemed reasonable, right? It seemed of course of course Michael Jackson would do this. And you know, I think it's also because Michael Jackson as a person uh, the way his ego manifested itself was very much outside of his body hmm. um, in a way that it had nothing to do with the way he like spoke right. and huh. he was never really like brash, right? So all of his ego lived beyond him in a way that was not as, 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 as you know, bold as a rapper might be. Because it wasn't, it was like he was, he was so large right. as a personality. That like it like it was he you couldn't pin it down. Yeah, it's almost like you ran out of ideas, right? It's like there's no other way to be big, so I'm gonna just really go all out because I just don't have anything else to do. You yeah. know, when you're this big, you have nothing else to do. What are you listening to right now that that's like really getting you? Um, I like weirdly I like the new Rick Ross album. Um, I like Maggie Rogers a lot. I think Maggie mm-hmm. Rogers put together an EP I really enjoyed. Um. I've been spending a lot of time with like revisiting things that I maybe didn't give a lot of like didn't give enough spin to last year. So I've been spending a lot of time with the last Miranda Lambert album, which is a heavy album. It's a lot of songs and it's really sad. It's like a double album. Hmm. Um, And I'll give you one more because I don't want to. I mean, I'm listening to a lot. Good. That's fine. Um, And I'm listening to. Uh, a metal band called Wolves in the Throne Room. Okay, I don't know that. Yeah, they're they're pretty good. I like them a lot, and I'm like revisiting their last two albums to see if I can get back into metal again. As a poet, listening to music, do you have lyrics that just sort of latch onto your soul that like just hang out there for years? So, like I have like from like I have lyrics like I listen to like whether it's like Josh Ritter, yeah, and it's like some powerful lines, or I'll just have like early. Some of it's just kind of humorous, like the was the the E forty line. He says. Colder than a colder than a pot of colder to a whale. Yeah, like that line just that's it's all it just kind of hangs out in my head. Yeah, or the the whole Josh Ritter song in all honesty uh, about uh, the girl in the war. Yeah, and uh, I mean just like and it just hangs out there like and it kind of mixes in with all the the lines from Batman movies and comics right. and there's yeah. this chaos in my brain. Are there lyrics? that like get inside your soul and stay there that are just accessible to you at all times? Not anymore because I think that like I listen to so much music and I am so often balancing lines of poetry that I love Right. that like I, I think I like maybe they'll stick for a couple hours and I'll write them down or whatever and then I, I kind of move on. I, I try to make as much room as possible in my brain for as many things that can inspire me and then I put them in a place that's not my brain and then move on somewhere else. Oh good. Yeah. Which is part of the process for It's you. part of the process. Yeah, definitely part of the process. That's really good. Yeah. Hey, man, thanks for your time. Thanks for having me. This Absolutely. Great. Really appreciate it. And thank you for joining me for this episode of the At Sea Podcast. If you jump to abdulraqib.com, that's A-B-D-U-R-R-A-Q-U-I-B, abdulraqib.com, you can dig into all of the great work that Hanif is currently doing, as well as find links to his books, which are more than worth your time and money. If you're resonating with this podcast, I'd love to have you on the team, as it were. Patrons get early access to often unedited audio from these interviews and are helping to shape its future. Head to patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N, patreon.com, and search my name, Justin McRoberts. Until next time.